beautiful people. I hope that you are doing well. That was an act of bravery. The reason why I wanted to show you that is that it has everything to do with priming and prompting that we are seeing all the time throughout history of those in charge. The reason I picked that particular snippet is because of the title of the video. Uh, side note is that did win the BAFTA award in 2012. Um, if I can find the original poster, I will leave a link below. But the title itself is 2 plus 2 equals 5. And he was standing up against this ridiculous idea that 2 plus 2 equals 5 because it does not. But if you were to go on social media right now, you would find cases where academia is attempting to push that very agenda. So today's focus is on priming and prompts with respect to the individual and collective human behavior and the control of either by tyrants. They are vastly overlooked and perhaps intentionally, but why? Why? Because the controllers can actually push just about any agenda they would like with the right messaging using the right techniques and employing priming and prompts such as isolation, sensory deprivation, slogans, chanting, music, and of course, fear, guilt, and my personal favorite, love bombings. We did our live stream. We, we asked the question, are humans solely at the mercy of hierarchies? It would seem no. And honestly, the world actually would be easier to understand and control if people simply obeyed based on doing what they are told by someone in a higher position. And it's, it's not hard to think about that. But the, the reality behind it is a little bit more frightening. Um, in the most general of terms, humans will obey or not obey based off of their identifying with an ideology or with an idea. In a moment, I'm just gonna summarize the Milgram experiments, his interpretation, and then what Alex Haslip's interpretation is. But first, I wanna show you a real world example of priming and prompting and how it can actually be used for nefarious, pur nefarious purposes and how it can be used to control and manipulate the population. So what this is, this is a clip from John Anderson's YouTube channel and it's Constantine speaking. He is of the YouTube channel Trigonometry. So let's go there now. My wife sent me this experiment uh, very uh, literally a couple of days ago where they did an experiment with a group of women yep. and they put scars on their faces and yep. they told these women that they're going into a job interview and the purpose of the experiment is to find out whether people with visual, uh, facial disfigurements face discrimination. Uh, they showed them the scars in the mirror. The women saw themselves with these scars. And as they led them out of the room, they said, we're just going to touch it up a little bit. And as they touched it up, they removed the scarring completely. So the women went into the job interview thinking that they are scarred but actually being their normal selves. And the result of the experiment is that those women then came back reporting massively increased level of discrimination. Indeed, they, many of them came back with comments that the interviewer had made that they felt were referencing their facial disfigurements. And this is why I think this ideology of victimhood is so dangerous, because if you preach to people constantly that we're all oppressed, that we're all being discriminated against at different levels. That because I'm an immigrant, I'm automatically disadvantaged. That because I have dark skin, I'm automatically disadvantaged. Then that primes people to look for that. And it's like, the, you know, when you buy a new car, you see that car everywhere else as you drive around. It's that kind of effect, which is why this ideology of teaching people that they're victims is so incredibly damaging and so incredibly dangerous. We have to teach young people in particular that they're strong, that they're capable, that they're able to overcome adversity, not that they're victims. And that is why I say it is so nefarious, because think of how quickly these women were primed because they already had to have the belief inside their head, right? They already did believe that people are going to be discriminated against because they're hideous looking. And so it, it's kind of 
it just like a validation and the only way for humanity to get out of this thing that we seem to be on all the time we have to be mindful of little things that can make us do things that maybe we wouldn't do if we knew the reasons behind it. So this is the summary of the Milgram's experiment. 780 people were part of the experiment. All were teachers and the learner was an actor. They, of course, the teacher thought that it was up for a coin toss. The teacher would be administering a shock ranging from 15 to 450 volts. Different labels, um, different levels were actually labeled slight, intense, danger, and the final level just had XXX, right? Um, and each teacher was given a 45 volt shock so that they would better understand the punishment. They told the people that um, joined the experiment, so the teachers, that basically what they were trying to do is find out the effects of learning abilities and punishment. So the actor then had a pre-recorded response to shocks ranging from grunts of pain, pleading, claim of heart condition to eventual silence. The experimenter would tell the teacher to continue administering shocks if they showed any hesitation. And that in fact is what the experiment was about, is to see how many people would blindly obey authority. And this is the section that Haslam himself re-examined and came to a completely different conclusion. So Milgram thought that only one to 3% of the population would continue to the full voltage. However, his first trial actually showed 65% went all the way while 80% went above 150 volts that is when the actor would scream. One that had continued even cried when he found out when he was debriefed uh, that it was just a hoax, it was a different experiment because the dude actually believed that he had killed the person, the learner. Now, it, it's not hard to understand that this would be devastating to see people blindly following orders. Some even pleaded with the experimenter to stop asking them to push the button and yet they continued. And why? And that's really the question. Milgram concluded 65% of the population will continue to obey to the very end, whereas 80% would obey until the pain was evident. Now put that in a different way, in the context of what he was attempting to understand. And that would mean that 80% of the population could be influenced to round up people and put them into internments, internment camps, whereas 65% would go to the final solution. So realistically, think about it from that horrifying perspective. 80% would obey until there was some kind of outward force as somebody screaming. However, Alex Haslam went back to the records. Here is what he found out. Whenever the teacher hesitated, the experimenter would say one of four things. Please continue. 65% would obey. Number two, the experiment requires you to continue. 46 would 46% 46 would obey. It's absolutely essential that you continue. 10% would obey. Whereas you have no other choice, 0% would obey. In the light of saying you have no other choice, 0 chose to continue. So when he sees this, he's going, well, obviously it can't be about obedience to hierarchy. Because when outright ordered, they said no. So what was it? Why were these people willing to shock a man even after he screamed and then suddenly went silent? Haslam summarizes that it is whether or not the teacher or human identifies with said ideology or said goal or said idea 
in this case, it is the amount that they identified with science. Upon that, he decided to conduct his own experiment. He had a control group and two other groups. One group would be a positive, so he would be priming them positively, like, why is science important to you? What do you like about science? What do you have in common with science? And then he had another group that he wanted to be negative. Um, list three things that are problematic with science. List things that you dislike about science. List what differentiates you from science. And what was the outcome after priming, after making some pro-science, while others would be questioning science? Um, pro, the obedience rate was 48.1% whereas the ones that were questioning, it was as low as 7.4%. And that, my friends, is why you are not allowed to question the science. That is why you are not allowed to question certain things, because priming is such a powerful tool. And mind you, they would have already been primed in the first place because science is very prevalent in everybody's life and it's so something that you have a connection to get into all of that right now. Anyway, so why did Alex um, Haslam actually question just following orders? It's because of the Nuremberg trials, yes. Um, he thought that it was a way to mitigate one's responsibility and upon research, many of those who said they were just following orders didn't just follow orders. They, they actually believed in that ideology and would almost do things, they would do things without being told to further the ideology. And that is what scares me. It's not that people obey more when they believe in an ideology or an idea, but rather that the wanting to belong to the idea can so easily be manipulated. And once they are manipulated, they can stop, but it may go too far. Just like when you watch videos of Pol Pot and the people celebrating, when you watch videos of Mao, you know, when he's first coming into office, everybody's celebrating, and uh, or Lenin, they get caught up in this idea and fever pitching, and it's not until somebody screams, right, jars them into saying, hey, no, this isn't right, that they start to ask these questions, and that is, in fact, why asking questions is so important. And ultimately, that is why um, soft censorship, censorship in general, is so important to the ruling class and the controllers. Now, this is obviously a very short gloss over um, because we did cover most of this in the live stream. But what I do um, is encourage you to go and look at Alex Haslam's uh, video. And um, also, I, I need to find the link because I have his essay. I just can't remember where I got it. So I will try to find that leak and post it um, below. And just remember uh, to be in a free world, to be um, off the grind of people taking advantage of other people, questions have to be allowed to be asked. And right now it seems like you're, you get in trouble for even asking questions. So we cannot have that normalized in our society or all is lost. All right, I'm gonna end this, but I am gonna have the clip that I promised. It is about bravery in World War II. And as I've always stated that sometimes you have to really dig deep to be brave, but it is so important, especially right now when our voices still matter. All right, thanks for joining me. Peace out, bye. We feel obliged to tell you that there are among us a certain number of Jews. One. When France fell in June of 1940, the German army allowed the French to set up a government in the southern city of Vichy. It was headed by the French World War I hero, Marshal Philippe Pétain, who was granted the full powers of a dictator. Pétain cooperated actively with the Germans. He stripped Jews of their rights. He pushed them out of professions. Revoking laws against anti-Semitism, he rounded up French Jews and put them into internment camps and took a dozen other authoritarian steps, large and small, including the requirement that every morning French schoolchildren honor the French flag 
with a full fascist salute, right arm outstretched, palm down. On the scale of the adjustments necessary under German occupation, saluting the flag each morning was a small matter. Most people complied, but not those living in a town of Le Chambon sur Lignon. Le Chambon is one of a dozen villages on the Vivarais Plateau, a mountainous region not far from the Italian and Swiss borders in south-central France. The winters are snowy and harsh. The area is remote, and the closest large towns are well down the mountain, miles away. The region is heavily agricultural, with farms tucked away in and around piney woods. For several centuries, Le Chambon had been home to a variety of dissident Protestant sects, chief among them the Huguenots. The local Huguenot pastor was a man named André Trocmé. He was a pacifist. On the Sunday after France fell to the Germans, Trocmé preached a sermon at the Protestant temple of Le Chambon. Loving, forgiving, and doing good to our adversaries is our duty, he said. Yet we must do this without giving up and without being cowardly. We shall resist whenever our adversaries demand of us obedience contrary to the orders of the gospel. We shall do so without fear, but also without pride and without hate. Giving the straight-armed fascist salute to the Vichy regime was, to Trocmi's mind, a very good example of obedience contrary to the orders of the gospel. He and his co-pastor, Edouard Théi, had started a school in Le Chambon several years earlier called the Collège Sevenon. They decided that there would be no flagpole and no fascist salutes at Sevenon. Vichy's next step was to require all French teachers to sign loyalty oaths to the state. Trocmi, Théi, and the entire staff of Sevenon refused. Pétain asked for a portrait of himself to be placed in every French school. Trocmi and Théi rolled their eyes. On the one-year anniversary of the Vichy regime, Pétain ordered towns across the country to ring their church bells at noon on August 1st. Trocmi told the church custodian, a woman named Amélie, not to bother. Two summer residents of the town came and complained. The bell does not belong to the marshal, but to God, Amélie told them flatly. It is rung for God, otherwise it is not rung. Throughout the winter and spring of 1940, conditions for Jews across Europe grew progressively worse. A woman appeared at the Trocmi's door. She was terrified and trembling from the cold. She was Jewish, she said. Her life was in danger. She had heard Le Chambon was a welcoming place. And I said, come in, Andre Trocmi's wife Magda remembered years later. And so it started. Soon more and more Jewish refugees began showing up in Le Chambon. Trocmi took the train to Marseille to meet with a Quaker named Burns Chalmers. The Quakers provided humanitarian aid for the internment centers that had been set up in southern France. The camps were appalling places, overrun with rats, lice, and disease. At one camp alone, 1,100 Jews died between 1940 and 1944. Many of those who survived were eventually shipped east and murdered in Nazi concentration camps. The Quakers could get people, especially children, out of the camps, but they had nowhere to send them. Trocmé volunteered Le Chambon. The trickle of Jews coming up the mountain suddenly became a flood. In the summer of 1942, Georges Lemerand, the Vichy minister in charge of youth affairs, paid a state visit to Le Chambon. Pétain wanted him to set up youth camps around France, patterned after the Hitler youth camps in Germany. Lemerand swept up the mountain with his entourage, resplendent in his marine blue uniform. His agenda called for a banquet, then a march to the town stadium for a meeting with the local youth, then a formal reception. But the banquet did not go well. The food was barely adequate. Trocmi's daughter accidentally spilled soup down the back of Lamaran's uniform. During the parade, the streets were deserted. At the stadium, nothing was arranged. The children milled around, jostling and gawking. At the reception, a townsperson got up and read from the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Then a group of students walked up to Lemerand and in front of the entire town presented him with a letter. It had been drafted with Trocmi's help. 
Earlier that summer, the Vichy police had rounded up 12,000 Jews in Paris at the request of the Nazis. Those arrested were held in horrendous conditions at the Velodrome d'Hiver, south of Paris, before being sent to the concentration camp at Auschwitz. Le Chambon, the children made clear, wanted no part in any of this. Mr. Minister, the letter began, we have learned of the frightening scenes which took place three weeks ago in Paris, where the French police, on orders of the occupying power, arrested in their homes all the Jewish families in Paris to hold them in the Valdive. The fathers were torn from their families and sent to Germany, the children torn from their mothers, who underwent the same fate as their husbands. We are afraid that the measures of deportation of the Jews will soon be applied in the southern zone. We feel obliged to tell you that there are among us a certain number of Jews, but we make no distinction between Jews and non-Jews. It is contrary to the gospel teaching. If our comrades, whose only fault is to be born in another religion, received the order to let themselves be deported, or even examined, they would disobey the order received, and we would try to hide them as best we could. We have Jews. You're not getting them.